Hi, I'm Margaret, Adult Services Librarian here at Thomas Crane. Um, and we're really excited to have Tara Teaspoon with us this evening. Um, a former senior food editor of Martha Stewart Living over six years, um, Ladies Home Journal, uh, and most recently, and why we have you here tonight, I'm really glad to have you, is released last year, 2020, um, Live Life Deliciously, Recipes for Busy Weekdays and Leisurely Weekends. Let's see, did you, did you want to kick off with a, a presentation? I know you had some slides. I'd love to. Thanks for having me. I, um, I do. I have a little slideshow and just a story about my background and some details about the cookbook and why I wrote the cookbook. So I'd love to get that going. I'll share my screen and then everyone can see uh, the presentation. So I'll get started. I, I'm Tara Bench, as was said, and I'm often called Tara Teaspoon. I am presenting my debut cookbook tonight, and it's called Live Life Deliciously. came out in October of 2020, right uh, just before the holidays, our pandemic holidays. And so it was a unique year last year to launch a cookbook, but I'm so excited to be here because I'm still touting it. Um, I'll tell you why I wrote it and what I've learned in 20 years of being in media cooking, both in magazines and on TV. I, uh, I'll talk about my cooking point of view and what my audience, who my audience is, who I'm writing for. Um, we'll see if you fit the bill. So to me, cookbooks are everyday useful, but they also reflect a culture and an era. And even though I live in a small New York City apartment, I am a major cookbook collector. From vintage cookbooks from the early 1900s to the fondue craze cookbooks of the 70s and classic standards, which amazingly stand the test of time, like The Joy of Cooking, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Rick Bayless's Mexico, One Plate at a Time, and many, many more that you would find on library shelves and in some of your own cookbook collections. And like many of you, I sometimes flip through these cookbooks with no intention of cooking. Um, they remind me of another era. They transport me to another culture. And they allow me to be a culinary traveler to far off locales. And my goodness, we needed that last year when we couldn't travel. And so it's just such a wonderful way to, to escape and to go into another world. So to have my own cookbook come into your homes and libraries is such a dream and an honor. So let me tell you uh, a little bit about why I wrote it. I consider myself a culinary educator first. I want to get the right tools into the hands of cooks. And I want cooking to be a way to build traditions and make memories and show you how that's possible and enjoyable. And I kind of have four pillars of culinary perspective. And if you think about them, they're sound, sight, taste, and memory. And so memory is an important part of a culinary experience. My cookbook is peppered with my first taste and food sensory memories. When I think of my mom cooking, my memory goes right to a skillet of sauteing onions. And that smell and that sound says dinner to me. It says family and home and comfort. And I spent my childhood cooking with mom and grandma. And family get-togethers revolved around beautifully prepared meal, even if it was just breakfast. And the whole wheat, the whole wheat pancakes that you see on the bottom right here, um, it's my enhanced version of my grandma's recipe, minus the much beloved to me sound of grandma's blender cracking the wheat. You know, now I have my own blender cracking that wheat, but those are just beloved pancakes and have those memories. And I wanted to share that. And as a young adult, I moved to New York City and it vastly expanded my culinary point of view. And just by having so many cultural food choices and flavor profiles, which were all new to me, was incredible. I remember eating my first pork rind at a tiny Asian restaurant in Queens, and it was a delicious, 
eye-opening experience having grown up in the West with very little authentic Asian food. With the recipes in my book, I want readers to have those aha moments. Like, I didn't know I loved tater tot nachos or chimichurri sauce. And I mean, really, who wouldn't love tater tot anything? But, you know, so what brought me from my suburban home in the Rocky Mountains to New York City in the first place? I will tell you. Um, let me switch pictures here. So probably the dream of every aspiring chef and newly minted graduate of culinary school of my generation was to work with Martha Stewart. And my dream came true in the late 90s when I became a food editor at Martha Stewart Living, occasionally cooking with her on TV, as you see in the photos. And, you know, Martha Stewart with her magazines and cookbooks and TV show, I think changed culinary history in that before Martha, you could either cook, you know, gourmet food at home like Julia Child, or you were a home cook sticking to Americanized lasagna and quick and easy cookies from the Good Housekeeping magazine. And Martha showed that home cooks could up their game by learning the basics and presenting food beautifully, elegantly, and most important, deliciously. She was a huge influence on my culinary point of view, and I was very lucky to be able to work with her. So let me switch here. Um, her influence taught me how to teach basic skills through new takes on classic recipes and luscious food styling to aspire to on a regular weeknight. You know, you, you flipped through the pages of her magazine and it was aspire, something to aspire to. You know, it was certainly inspiring, but it sort of took you to this other place that you really wanted to be. And I learned how to, you know, inspire that confidence in readers to build their own skill set. And many people don't know that Martha started her career as a stockbroker but early on realized that cooking was her passion. And she started a catering business in 1972, which gained a following. And because it showcased her cooking talent and her originality, it was a success. And that small business grew into larger businesses that continue to be an inspiration to me and to follow my passion and like Martha to be authentic and enthusiastic about a topic, which to me is endlessly fascinating. And that's cooking and creating recipes that a home cook can make. Um, I wanted my first cookbook to be an inspiration and a learning experience and to still be everyday cooking friendly. So that was very important to me. And the book is arranged in sections, which you can dip into randomly, such as new pantry staples, the right equipment, which includes an homage to knives. I have to say, I am shocked at how many people struggle to cook because of a dull or tiny knife. And it is tool number one in my house. Another chapter is bites, dips, and snacks, which is one of my favorite sections because it's grazing goodness and food for appetizers, tapas parties, or just hanging out. And then weeknight routines is a chapter that includes base recipes that can be used in several different dinners. And this makes shaking up your midweek routine totally uncomplicated. And then of course I have a chapter called Sweets to Share. I am a huge baking fan and I make treats for friends. And I know my readers on my blog are huge baking fans too. So it's actually the biggest chapter in the book. Um, most of my blog readers at teraspoon.com are you know, 25 to 45 years old. That is, that is the average. And those are the years of learning and exploring and finding out what you like and the years of the most frequent entertaining and getting get together. So people of that range, they're bringing people into their home. They're wanting to have food parties and cooking parties and feed people. And this is a book for the very experienced cook who is maybe tired of making the same old dishes and wants to expand their horizons with similar, you know, easy to make recipes, but it's also for those beginners. But you know, why not upgrade your cooking game to something that sounds amazing, like 
caramelized onion and smoked Gouda mac and cheese, or bacon-wrapped sweet potatoes, or tomato and Roquefort steak flatbread. I, you know, you could say, hey, let's have pigs in a blanket, but it sounds totally different, right? Pigs in a blanket are delicious, but it's really something that I considered when I was describing the recipes. I wanted those recipes to sound beautiful. Um, you know, and over the years, I have calculated that I've developed and created almost 10,000 recipes over the course of my career. And adding new spices and sauces was totally essential to keeping things interesting and fresh. And of course, necessity is the mother of invention. And when I was a food director at Ladies Home Journal, the readers wanted to reuse the same spice that I recommended several issues back or pull that bottle of chili sauce out again so it didn't sit in the fridge. So the recipes that I was creating for those magazines were always grounded in some sort of practicality. And I wanted to bring that to the book because to me that's very important. That's the way I want to, want to be treated. That's the way I want to cook is if I buy a special spice for a fun new recipe, I want to know how to use that again instead of using it for that same recipe six months later and then your spices are old, they sit in the cupboard. I really think about that when I create recipes and when I wrote this cookbook. So when I tell you to purchase sumac for this amazing broccoli and sumac dish that I have, I explain what sumac is and how to use it in other dishes because I want you to spice up your other weeknight meals. And so in my chapter, The New Pantry Staples, I list key ingredients that kickstart a multitude of flavor pro profiles. And let's see if I clicked the next one. And there's that broccoli with sumac and dates. It's one of my favorites. So nothing in the book, uh, no ingredients are hard to find. It's all about the flavor combinations you can create from having things in your pantry already, like capers, molasses, limes, fish sauce, hot sauce, cayenne, thyme, even brown sugar I use in savory and sweet dishes. But having sort of a new take on your pantry and those staple flavors and spices that you typically have on hand will take your cooking to another level. And in, in the book, that recipe called Ridiculously Delicious Grapefruit Guacamole, um, in that recipe, I add a pop of hot sauce and chopped grapefruit. And that juiciness and the bite of hot is such a delicious combination. And this is the way that I'm using those pantry staples, those new flavors, those sauces that I have on hand. My mandarin and prosciutto crostini mixes the sweet of brown sugar and mandarins with the tang of balsamic vinegar and salty prosciutto, which, you know, that combination I would totally eat off a shoe if I was, you know, able to. <laughs> it's so delicious. Um, but this flavor profile, it triggers a sensory men memory that tells my brain, ooh, I want that now. You know, the salty, sweet, these new flavors, these fun flavors that often we only taste at restaurants. And I'm teaching you simple ways to create those flavors at home. So as I said, my pillars of culinary perspective are sound and sight and taste and memory. And recipes can sound phenomenal, like I said. You know, I listed off a few of my recipes that I really considered uh, in the name. And you hear that difference, you know. A description can create joy, like, burrata with grilled peaches and orange zest chimichurri. That just sounds awesome and it draws you in. So, you know, cooking and eating use all the senses. I'm a food stylist, so you see the importance of making things look good to me. You know, um, you see from some of the photos on this slide in particular that I really appreciate presentation and I want the food to look delicious, appetizing, and the best that it can. And, you know, both in real life and entertaining, um, but also on social media, you know, which has become sort of our virtual dining room, um, especially now that we're kind of on it a lot more. We're not out and about as much. Um, 
but you know, we, I encourage, um, that presentation and I give tips throughout the cookbook on, Hey, how to make this look good or here's an idea for presentation so that your result can look as good as mine. And it's not hard. It's just taking that time to consider what plate am I serving this on? Um, you know, what are the colors in here? Do I need a pop of green or anything like that? And I encourage eating food that tastes so good, you remember the experience of eating it. You know, I say try new foods and flavors and find more that you love. For instance, you pretty much cannot leave my home without trying my rosemary olive butter. I am convinced that it's impossible not to crave it once that door has been opened. So I wrote this book for all those reasons. And that's why that it's a way for people to use their creativity to explore cooking and share it. Um, so that's, I, I would love to talk to all of you, answer questions. Thanks for, so much for listening to this presentation and sort of sharing that moment of why I wrote the book and what I was trying to get across with my background in food. Um, you know, I, I, have lots of stories and things like that, but this book was me being allowed to share it in a form that will be in your kitchens forever. So I really appreciate it. And I'm totally open to taking questions or, or chatting. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. And thanks for everyone. And if anyone tuned in while we were already started, this is being recorded, um, just so you're aware. But any, any questions for Tara, you can add to the chat, um, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, or right here on Zoom. Um, I think it's so fascinating. Your, your uh, experience in the food industry is pretty extensive. Um, wh what made you get so excited to create your own? Like, what, what did it take to go from working for other people to putting together your own recipes into this compilation for us to have? Great question. And you know what's funny is I thought, hey, I've been working as an editor at magazines for years. I've been creating recipes, putting them in magazines, and I've got this. I know how to do this, right? It's, it's going to be easy to write a cookbook because I've been writing recipes for so many years. It was a real challenge. And so going from, you know, being uh, an expert in publishing and magazine recipe writing and even running my own blog and writing recipes for TaraTeaspoon.com, um, writing a book was very different. So I, I found the hardest part of creating a cookbook was um, figuring out what chapters and how to break down all of the recipes that I wanted to include. And I wanted it to flow. I wanted you to be able to reopen the book and sort of thumb through it and have it pace really well. You know, when you read a novel, that's thought through. It has chapters. It has, you know, it goes in an order and you just kind of fall into it. Honestly, a cookbook is no different. If you can't do that in a cookbook, then it's not very thought through. And so that was a big challenge for me is to take some, a big project like this and say, how does this fit together? And then one of the big things for me was um, I wanted it to be super user friendly. So I wanted a recipe for a steak rub that I used in, you know, chapter number three to also be used in another recipe in chapter number five. So tying those together and being able to cross-reference throughout the book was really important for me. And so that was also a big challenge. But I just sort of approached it a little at a time. I changed it a lot. I edited it a lot. So that was kind of my process from going from, hey, I can do this to, oh, my goodness, this is really challenging, and then getting it out there. It's definitely telling a story. I like that it's still like reading through a novel, you say, so it's still definitely storytelling. Yes, yes. Um, and I did, I did read somewhere about when you, when you first got into the food industry coming out of college, um, it was the fluffy omelet. Is that, could you tell us a little bit about that? I, I, I just find it fascinating what it takes, just one little obstacle to becoming a whole new journey. I, I'd just like love for you to share that with everybody. Yes, absolutely. So that is a fun story. Um, I... I started as an intern at Martha Stewart Living Magazine right out of school. 
But before I started as an intern there, I had to interview. So I was still a culinary student when I interviewed um, with the test kitchen director at Martha Stewart. And I was living in Utah, going to school. So I had to fly to New York and have an in-person cooking test with the test kitchen director. And when I got there, you know, she, it was the Martha Stewart offices right in the middle of New York City. And she took me down the stairs to the test kitchen. And that was the first time I saw Martha Stewart. And she was at the bottom of the stairs. And I walked by her. And I'm 5'2", so I'm short. And she's six feet tall. And so she was such a presence. And I was so enamored at the time. I walked down the stairs, and there she was. And I got so nervous. And that was tough because I was already a ball of nerves because this was a cooking interview. Um, but it was exciting to see her. So we walked past Martha Stewart down the hall to the test kitchen. And I spent the day in the test kitchen of the magazine cooking for the kitchen director. And so I was basically needing to prove my skills and prove that I was, you know, good enough to come and work for them as an intern. And she put me through a few rigorous tests, cooking tests. And, you know, they were everything from chopping an onion to medium dice to, you know, making a certain sauce and, you know, all of these sort of culinary tests that sort of show your skill. One of those tests was to make a fluffy three egg omelet. She said, make, make a really fluffy three egg omelet. Well, I said, okay, I know how to do this. I went over, whipped the eggs, you know, put a little salt and pepper in it, made this omelet, came and presented it to her. And she said, no, this isn't fluffy. Go make it again. So, <laughs> I, you know, ball of nerves. I go back to my table. I whip those eggs even harder. I just whip, 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 you know, season it, make this omelet. She looks at it. No. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't fluffy enough. So I think I made that omelet three or four times. It was never fluffy enough for her. So finally, she's just like, forget it. So we moved on to the next test. Well, long story short, I was still in school when I interviewed. So several days later, I flew back, went back to school, to my university, and was in classes with my fellow culinary students. And I said to them, you guys, I think I failed this test. I don't, I don't know how to make a fluffy omelet. How do you make a fluffy omelet? Well, everyone looked at me and they said, they, they all gave me the same answer. They said, separate your eggs. So you have egg whites and egg yolks. Whip your egg whites until they're super fluffy and fold in your egg yolks and then make your omelet. Well, that is basic culinary knowledge. Like I should have known that as a student. But it was eye-opening. I thought, oh, I should have known that. Long story short, yes, I failed the omelet test. I totally did. But um, they ended up hiring me as an intern, and I gained such amazing experience working in that test kitchen. I really love those. It's just something so small made the huge difference. They just saw something in you still to bring you in, which I work glad because now we have you here. Uh, yeah, exactly. Thanks. Uh, you also said that most of the people in your graduating class, like in culinary school, did go into um, catering or to become chefs in restaurants. What, what is the pull? Is there something dramatically different um, through the day, like to take that journey to become a chef versus doing food styling? That's a great question. Um, I think my impetus was even when I was a culinary student, you know, a young woman just learning uh, her path in her career, I realized that, you know, chefs and people who are caterers and food service employees, they are working when people are playing. So when you go out to dinner and you're enjoying the evening, the chef is in the back kitchen working his head off or her head off. And I didn't want that lifestyle. I knew I had a passion for cooking. I knew I loved cooking. And I didn't know there were other paths. But I did know that I didn't want the lifestyle of, you know, cooking on the weekends and working late hours. You know, in my head, I was like, I've got to be able to find a nine to five job where I can still be creative and cook and not have to, you know, work at night or on the weekends. 
So it was a challenge for me for several years while I was studying um, to figure out, you know, what my, what's my path? And I'll tell you, uh, you know, I'll ramble on, but I'll tell you, I ended up um, telling one of my professors in culinary school and saying, you know, I, I want to do something different. And I love food magazines. I want to make the food in these food magazines, you know, food and wine and Bon Appetit and Gourmet magazine were huge, right? You know, 25 years ago, and they still are. But I told my professor, I said, I want to make that food. Who makes it? Well, nobody knew. My professors and, and chefs all said, I don't know. One day, one of my professors brought me a page out of a magazine, and it was about food stylists. And, you know, she said, I think this is what you want to be. And it talked about how this food stylist made food for photography, and they used Crisco for ice cream, and Elmer's glue for milk. And I thought, well, they're, you know, it's not quite what I want to do. But I'll tell you, Margaret, that um, really educated me and opened my eyes to all the options that were out there for someone who enjoyed cooking and had a passion for that creativity. So that led me to, you know, test kitchens and magazine test kitchens. And I called, I think, every magazine test kitchen in the country to um, explore and see if they would hire me as an intern. But that led me down that path. And, and it really is, it's a different lifestyle. You know, then I went into publishing, yet I was able to cook and learn food styling, which is preparing food for photography. And I loved it. I mean, I grew, I gained a greater passion for, for that work. Obviously, all of that can be very nerve wracking. It's not something you just fall into overnight. What advice can you pass on in, in overcoming your nerves into, into doing something like working with Martha Stewart? And just, <laughs> right? It, it was nerve wracking. And, and I'll tell you, um, I am so grateful to my family and my parents growing up. They really instilled in me a sense of adventure. And when I first went to New York and started working for Martha Stewart, I really looked at it as an adventure. And I was so young, my, my early 20s, and probably didn't know better. But I think that sort of helped my nerves as I just thought, hey, this is awesome. This is an adventure. I'll move on from here. I'll do something different. And it just happened that, you know, they liked me. I liked them. And... We, you know, they hired me and I stayed there for many years working. Uh, but I think it was just that sense of exploring an adventure that I wanted to learn and I wanted to see. And, you know, was lucky enough to be in my early 20s when I had that experience. And so that's kind of your mindset. But it, it did. It gave me that um, experience so that then years later when I started needing to be on TV and do cooking demonstrations and you know, be more present with my, you know, person, um, then I had that practice of just kind of like looking at it, being a little bit, uh, you know, step back and not being too, too nervous. But I will tell you, Margaret, I still, I have stage fright. I don't like being on TV. I don't like, you know, having my face on the camera. Are um, we making you nervous now? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I get nervous. I mean, I try to say, hey, this is just a casual chat. <laughs> but really, it's, it's definitely a thing inside of me. And I don't know how people do it that, are easy, <laughs> that find it easy to perform or be on TV. But, you know, it's still definitely a thing. Uh, but I try to find the enjoyment in it. I really do like sharing food and teaching people how to cook. And if TV is the way to do it, then, then I'll, I'll buck up. You have shared a lot and um, looking through and the photographs are beautiful and your recipe book, by the way, um, and they are inspiring to look at. Um, what Have you been inspired by different cultures, different flavors from traveling? Is it, how much of that influences your recipes? That's a great question. A lot. You know, he, so if people don't have it in front of them, um, this is my book and it is definitely the pages inside are a mix of everything from homey food 
to, um, you know, this is a Spanish tortilla from Spain. And it's, you know, so I have a lot of Thai recipes and um, Filipino and Mexican. Um, and I love cooking that way. You know, I have been able to travel a lot. When I was quite young, my family lived overseas. So that was a fun experience. And moving to New York, as I said, opened my eyes to a lot of different uh, globally influenced food and authentic ethnic food. Um, and so I eat that way, I cook that way, and I wanted to really impart that part of my personality into the book. So yeah, one of my favorite recipes in the book is a uh, Thai meatball coconut curry. And, you know, it's beautiful, it's flavorful, but you can make it with ingredients that you can find at a normal grocery store. So nothing, nothing is esoteric or things that you have to really search for ingredients at a specialty store. I want people to be able to experience those flavors in a recipe they can make on a Wednesday night, you know? So yeah, it definitely has influenced my cooking is just my experiences and, and being able to live where I live. So absolutely. What, what do we do at home to make our present, to present our food the way yours looks? What are some simple tips uh, just for a weeknight dinner? Good question. I, so listen, Truth be told, I have shelves and shelves of props, dishes and platters and bowls that I use for my photography so that everything looks fresh and different. But in a normal home, I realize that, you know, you may have three serving bowls and one platter and all your dishes look the same, yet it really is um, a process to think about how am I going to present this food or this meal, you know? Um, serving dinner out of a pan, um, you know, with a dirty hot pad underneath it, isn't appetizing. But if you take the time to just transfer it to a nice plate and put a nice serving spoon with it, maybe sprinkle it with a chopped fresh herbs, your dinner looks photo worthy rather than just like, hey, I threw this together, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. And it literally like takes two more minutes. So that's the first thing I tell people is just as you're making the food, as you're thinking about, hey, I'm going to serve this food in an hour to my partner or my husband or my family and my children or my friends that are coming over, think about what dish am I going to serve it in and how am I going to serve it? What's going to be served with it? Uh, did I cook this in a slow cooker and it's going to look all brown? Do I need to add chopped parsley or some thyme or something? to really pop, make it pop at the end. So just simple things like that, I say, are kind of the first step. The next thing is you have to understand um, food styling definitely is a skill. Making food look good for the camera, there is a lot that goes into it. I have a team of people who are helping me cook, and I'm able to just concentrate on putting the food on set. I use tweezers to move food around. I have a photographer that lights it perfectly and takes that beautiful photo. So the photos are definitely aspirational. However, it's achievable. So I don't use any tricks like glue for milk or anything like that. It's all the real food. And so just taking some time and saying, hey, instead of serving, you know, these meatballs slathered with sauce and they're just kind of ugly, I'm going to serve them on the, you know, the sauce on the side so that it looks very beautiful when I put it on the table. And, oh, look, that's how Tara did it in her cookbook. But then on your plate, you're going to put that sauce on the meatballs. So it, it, you might have to serve the food differently to make it look beautiful. But it's just kind of thinking through all of that. I think that's such a mood booster, too, just taking the extra two minutes just to just to put it on a new plate changes yeah. the whole atmosphere and environment. <laughs> I think, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, in addition to magazines, um, you have done a lot of TV um, and some 
fun shows, some contests. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience as a contestant? Yes. <laughs> so I will tell you, many years ago, I was the food editor at Ladies Home Journal. And Food Network came and asked me to be a judge on one of their reality cooking shows. And I thought, sure, I'll go be a judge. You know, they were looking for experts in the food field to come and judge this cooking competition. And it was years ago, it was a Thanksgiving cooking competition. And so I was the judge. I didn't have to cook. But it opened my eyes to reality TV. And I realized the producers were trying to drum up drama. You know, they were trying to say, oh, these people are behind. Are they going to mess up? They might lose. And they would ask me specific questions to drum up this drama and this, you know, oh my gosh, panic. Even though in real life, there wasn't a lot of panic. The show was going swimmingly. It was lovely. You know, it was interesting. And having had that experience, I thought, ooh, I would never want to cook on one of those reality TV shows. That's a lot of pressure. But years later, Food Network came to me again and said, hey, would you be a contestant? And they wanted me to come and be a contestant on a Christmas cookie competition show. So I'll tell you what, I said no three times. Finally, the third time they asked me, I said, okay, fine, let me try this. So knowing what I knew, I thought, okay, I'll go into this competition um, knowing that I don't want to create any drama. I just kind of want to make amazing Christmas cookies and, and get through it. Well, it was a new experience being a contestant. Um, it was very hard. You were put into a kitchen that you were unfamiliar with and you weren't able to shop for your own ingredients. You just, you know, we kind of told the producers, Hey, you know, could you have some butter and these sprinkles and this flavoring for me? But sometimes they didn't even have all the ingredients you might need for your recipes. Then as you see on all these competition shows, they say, okay, ready, set, make this. And it's new. You don't, you've never made it before. It's some new challenge. And so you're in this kitchen, you don't know what you're doing. You have only two hours to make this massive baked situation. And so the drama presented itself. It was crazy, Margaret. It was stressful. And it was very hard because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I love my food to look good and taste good. But, you know, in the limited amount of time that they give you on a TV show, my food looked crazy. <laughs> it tasted good, but I couldn't make it as beautiful as I wanted to. And then time was up and the judges came in and they were judging. So anyway, that was my experience. And I know that show still reruns every Christmas on Food Network. And I get messages and people are like, I saw you. And I kind of am just like, oh, it's a little bit embarrassing, but I had fun. I'll never do it again. <laughs> That's what most people say after they do a food network <laughs> challenge. Yes. The pressure is too much. Um, was, other, yes. it, you were on there, though. We did see it this um, holiday season, you your episode. Run. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, it was, it was something to laugh about in hindsight, right? You made it to the last round, though. I believe I did. you I did, did very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Let's see. And, and just a reminder, as we're chatting, feel free. Any questions about anything Tara's talking about, feel free to just throw them right in the chat and I'll make sure she gets them. <laughs> it's been fun to, to do such different things throughout my career. You know, I never dreamed I would write recipes for magazines, let alone be on TV with Martha Stewart or be on the Today Show. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of fun opportunities and really that's kind of where I learned what I wanted to put in my cookbook um, is just kind of sharing all of my favorite things that I've been able to create for all through all of these experiences over the years. You have a blog in addition to all of this. Um, even a, aside from just what's on your blog, what does it take to do that? I know there are so many foodies um, in our community. What does it take to craft your own recipes and, and share that with everybody. Yeah. You know, um, 
writing a blog is very different than being a magazine food editor. Uh, I started my blog. So ladies home journal magazine was where I was the food director for many years after Martha Stewart and the publishing company closed that magazine. And so once that closed, I just started consulting and freelancing again. And um, I missed sharing recipes with people every month. You know, my recipes would go out to millions of people every month in the magazine. And suddenly I didn't have a place to share my creations. And so I started a website and it really was just to share recipes. And over the years, I had um, a dear friend that helped me realize that having a website and blogging could be a business. And I really was spending a lot of time and energy sharing this, these recipes online. And I almost, it was almost like going back to school, Margaret, is learning how to become a blogger and run a website. And I have had to learn about search on engine optimization and, you know, the website backend and plugins and Google Analytics and all of that just to be able to share my recipes with people and have people be able to search them online. And so it's been years to move from being a publishing editor to a blogger. Uh, and now I really enjoy it. I really enjoy that I can reach a lot of people and engage with them, all of them. So as an editor, I never talked to the readers of the magazine. You know, if there were questions, there was another department to answer questions. And so having my own blog and my own website gives me that chance to really interact with people and talk them through um, issues and hear what they have to say and take their suggestions. And I love it. So being a blogger has become really important to me and a way that, you know, I can quickly get information to people and recipes and help them, you know, with their dinner ruts or help them entertain at a party. Um, but it was a big transition and a big learning curve for me. As far as party entertaining, how, how do you maintain the food looking good and stylish in large amounts for for huge gatherings, which hopefully we'll have again soon. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I'll tell you what. I think planning a party, um, I think you have to be strategic about it. So if you entertain and you're, you know, serving dinner, having a dinner party, let's say, you don't want to have a menu of five different recipes that all have to come out of the oven at the same time and be hot you know, entertaining is about bringing people together and enjoying delicious food. And so I'm, I'm flipping through my book right now because I want to show you some things that will help in that planning. So just like Thanksgiving dinner, you want a variety of foods that can land on the table and be delicious all at the same time. And at, even like at Thanksgiving, once the turkey comes out of the oven, then you put the baked rolls back in just to warm up a little. Maybe you toast or roast some vegetables really fast while you're carving the turkey. So you've thought through all of those things. And I think any dinner party can be thought through, kind of like Thanksgiving, but just on a smaller scale. But I think one of the things that really helps when you're bringing people together is to have some nibbles. Have something that doesn't need to be hot or what we call in the chef world, a la minute meaning at the last minute that you have to do something. So preparing foods ahead, I give a lot of tips in the cookbook that say, hey, you can prep these veggies ahead of time and in the last five minutes before you serve them, here's what you do. So you don't have to be in the kitchen for half an hour making this side dish. So one of the things that I love, among other things, so I have a really great white bean dip in the book that is great as a dip, as a starter. It even works as a sandwich spread. I really love it. But one of my favorite things, don't we all love cheese boards? You know, just nibbles on cheese with bread at the beginning of a party, you know, have a little sip with it. Well, I love cheese boards, but you know what? I also love just a yummy baguette smeared with butter. You know, it's kind of like my comfort food. So I thought, why not combine the two? 
and I made a flavored butter board. And this is something I love because absolutely you can make this ahead. And it's basically butters flavored with different herbs. This one has sun-dried tomatoes and herbs in it. Another one has olives and roasted garlic. And a butter board can be prepared ahead, ready to go. When your guests arrive, you serve them this yummy, you know, appetizer. But just kind of getting creative. It's something different. It's something new. You know, if you're entertaining, you've got uh, an appetizer prepared ahead. Maybe think about, oh, I'm going to make a soup and some yummy bread and a beautiful salad. And that doesn't take up oven space. It's just, it's easy to bring people together and enjoy that meal. So I'm rambling a bit, but I'm just saying there's a lot of different ways to look at entertaining and to take the stress out of it, to take that uh, overwhelmed feeling away from entertaining. Uh, we do have a question. Um, okay. What, uh, what does your own family ask you to make? What are their biggest requests? So I do, I get requests from my family and I travel home. Most of my family lives in the West in Utah. And so when I travel home, I definitely get requests. And lately, the last few years, as I've been writing the cookbook and it's published, um, the recipes were out of that book. So I'll, I'll tell you a few of them. Um, but one of them is in the book, it is a family favorite. It's the Swedish meatballs. And I make them a little bit different. I don't make a creamy sauce. I make a beautiful gravy and I actually put the sour cream that is classic in Swedish meatballs in the meatballs. So it tenderizes the meatballs and it flavors that delicious little meatball. But then the sauce is this beautiful glossy gravy and my family loves it. So let's see if I can find the page. I'll show you the picture really fast. Um, and then another one that we all love, in fact, I think I named it in the cookbook, Mary's Favorite Chicken Tacos, because um, they're my mother's favorite. So this, this is the Swedish meatballs, and you can see that it's not, you know, a creamy, heavy sauce. It's just the most delightful meal. Uh, we love it. So tacos is the other one that is a huge favorite at my in my family. And I'll show you that. Super easy. I make a really delicious rub for the chicken. Rub the chicken, cook it, and slice it up. And I kind of call them street tacos. So they are a huge favorite in my family. We always make these. The other one, if you can imagine, we have made this so many times as a family. Finally, a few weeks ago, we made it again, and my family said, okay, I think we're done. Like, we burned out on this recipe because we loved it so much, and we made it so often. It is the chicken pozole verde. It is the most delicious soup. Um, I, you know, roast peppers and onions and garlic to make the base of it, and there's hominy and chicken. You can buy a rotisserie chicken, so you don't even have to stress. Um, but... It's just the most delightful flavors. Others in the book, definitely those whole wheat pancakes, family favorite. The uh, Thai peanut curry, it's all vegetables. It's a great way to eat vegetables, and my family loves it. Um, so I could go on, but those are just some favorites. Well, all your food is, looks amazing. Um, we've made a few. Tastes amazing um, from the book. Uh, big concern in cooking is health so we do have a question how do you get the most flavor out of your food um when cooking at home while still being cognizant of food as a medicine of, of having a healthy dish yes isn't that the truth and i think that is a huge trend last year and especially this year um is eating whole and natural foods and being healthy and while i am not a specialized uh, recipe developer. I am not a dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist. I don't uh, specialize in what you'd call nutritious recipes. I am a huge proponent of eating in balance. And, you know, I'm trying to think, I love a good cake mix. I definitely use um, convenience foods occasionally. But for the most part, I make my own pesto for my lasagna. 
I, you know, I make things ahead. I chop all my salad greens ahead. Um, so I don't have to buy that pre-packaged, you know, situation. Um, I use fresh vegetables as much as possible, but I think getting the flavor in there, if you are eating a certain diet and you are, um, maybe cutting out calories, maybe cutting out sodium. I have that whole chapter in my book about pantry staples. And I really discuss that um, element of finding different spices or flavor bases or sauces that you may not typically cook with that can add amazing flavor. So for instance, you know, uh, a sweet chili sauce, just a little dab of that or a drizzle of that on a really healthy meal can enhance that flavor without adding a lot of unnutritious, um, you know, elements. But I think just balance. Honestly, I, I think everyone has, in, with, even within our family, we have someone who is celiac and needs to eat gluten-free. And we have somebody who eats vegan. So when I'm making chicken tacos and when I'm making, you know, roast, whatever it is, I consider that. And I think if you have that specialized diet, you also are thinking that way. So you know what to substitute, but still use the flavor elements. So instead of using chicken, we use chickpeas for that person in my family. We still use the same spice rub. So you don't need to take those spices out in order to have this really delicious, flavorful meal. Does that make sense? So it's really keeping with those flavor elements and maybe some new sauces and spices and incorporating them into whatever diet you are, are cooking for. And thank you to Food Lover for this next one. Um, when you gathered your recipes for your book, what was your first must have included recipe? Ah, that is such a good question. I think I had a, res a, a list of like 50 must have recipes at first. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, honestly, I've mentioned the pancakes a few times, but those are such a sentimental favorite for me that those were definitely in. Um, in the dessert chapter, I really wanted to have the soft ginger snaps with cream cheese frosting. Um, those are, they're just always a hit when I make them for people. They've been a favorite um, for me for many years. So I knew I wanted to share that. Um, and then other dishes, there were just a handful of flavor forward dishes. I think one of them was um, my Thai peanut curry. Another one was my corn succotash. I just love the combination of the vegetables and I make it every year when, you know, corn is in season. So there was a handful. Uh, I don't know that there was just like one that had to be in. Um, I would definitely say a handful of those recipes and some of those I mentioned, but yeah. Creating a recipe from scratch seems like doing math to me. What is that? Take? How much testing is involved to create these, these new flavors? Yeah. So great question. I, I get this a lot is how do you develop recipes from nothing? And I think really it's, it's experience. I've been cooking professionally for over 20 years and I think it's just different than um, cooking at home. So I know it, you know, many people that are watching this are saying, well, I've been cooking for my family for 30 years, you know, um, but it's a different way of looking at cooking. I think about um, what the food will look like, what ingredients I wanna use, and often I will develop the recipe on paper before I even go into the kitchen. So I will write down the recipe on paper, you know, hey, half a cup of this, a teaspoon of that, because of my experience of creating new recipes. Then of course you take it into the kitchen and it usually takes, um, anywhere from one to five times making that recipe to make sure it's perfect, to make sure it can be replicated at home, and then it can be published. So it, it just depends on what the recipe is, but I am a huge proponent of testing recipes and making sure they work perfectly before I share them. Because, you know, I don't want somebody at home to, you know, buy all these ingredients, take all the time to make it, and be unsuccessful. 
you're interested in collecting um, vintage cookbooks. How much different have recipes changed over time? What is the the appeal in a in a vintage cookbook collection? And and do you have any favorites? Um, that maybe we can try and track down for ourselves as well. <laughs> I, right? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure like names of favorites. I do. I love the old Better Homes and Gardens, um, you know, checker plaid cookbooks, the red and white ones. Um, they, you know, they go, they span back to, uh, you know, the fifties, the but I love old cookbooks, even from the turn of the century, because you flip through those and you realize they were, they were cooking with what they had available, and there wasn't much available. So even by region, you can see the difference between cooking. You know, somebody from Oregon, you know, that wrote a cookbook, it would be very different than somebody from Georgia. Somebody from Oregon back then wouldn't be cooking with lard and cornmeal and things like that. Or vice versa, you know, somebody from the South wouldn't be cooking with those, you know, Alaskan fish and things that, you know, the, the Northwest might have. So I love the regional differences. I love seeing um, sort of history in the making, you know, when, when people stopped using butter and started using Crisco because it came on the market and there was this new fat to use and then how it morphed back over, you know, 20 or so years to now people are back to using butter um, and not shortening. And I think just those vintage cookbooks just give you a little peek into the past. And sometimes it's fun to recreate those recipes using our new flavors and our new ingredients that we have now and accessible. Um, we have so much more accessible. So making like that delicious cake from the 50s, now you could add a fun spice, cardamom, where, you know, because it's available at the grocery store. So I, I just think that's fun. It just is inspiring um, to look back on those books. Um, in this past year, it seems everybody's really taking up a new hobby. A lot of people are taking up cooking. Uh, what is maybe the easiest recipe or like a really fun one to kind of learn as a new cook or a new baker um, from your book, what would be your recommendation? I know we have some here, even just on staff learning. So we're all, <laughs> what's I, your recommendation? Oh my gosh. I love this question and I haven't ever gotten it before. So I have to sort of think because there are a few that have come to mind. Um, so for bakers, I would say uh, the focaccia. And I will show you a picture of that. So it's a really close up. Look at that beautiful focaccia top. And it's got salt and rosemary. But for a, a baker that, somebody who loves baking, but wants to kind of take it up a notch, this is a very simple yeast bread that you don't even need a mixer for. The dough is really soft and you just sort of turn it by hand every few, you know, every half hour. It's got a long fermenting time, which means it, it wants to rise and be smushed down again and rise and be smushed down again. And I give you step by step. I give you every move to make, to make this focaccia and you will love it. It's just this fluffy, chewy, delicious bread. And I know in the pandemic, everybody jumped on the sourdough bandwagon and they were making homemade bread and sourdough. And I think that's awesome. I think get one or two kinds of bread under your belt that you're like, okay, I've, I've made bread. I know how to use yeast. I can do this. I think it's just so gratifying. And then another one, I certainly have chocolate chip cookies and easy, you know, drop cookies and cupcakes and cookie bars in my dessert chapter. But um, one of the things that I love that if you are a baker and love to make treats is making my Swiss meringue buttercream. So it's an egg white and sugar based frosting and it's silky and amazing and it's very pipeable so I made these beautiful cupcakes with the meringue buttercream and I made this buttercream chocolate that goes in this chocolate cake and that cake looks so hard it is so easy once you make that buttercream 
you are going to be a master chef and cake maker. So as far as baking, those are, those are probably the first things I would say, hey, explore this, learn this. This is so fun. Um, and then other things are, let me see, I would say for beginners, oh my goodness, this recipe is so easy. It's chicken in paper and it has a lot of fun flavors, but they're ingredients that you probably already have in your pantry, like golden raisins and carrots and chicken, and you cook it in a parchment packet. And it is, it takes 15 minutes in the oven. It looks hard to do, but it seriously is so easy. So I think for a beginner, that one's a fun one to start with because you, you, um, the end result will make you feel so successful. Um, gosh, I could go on forever. I think <laughs> it, it really depends on your taste is flip through the chapters. If you love a nibble, start at the beginning. If you love breakfast, um, you know, make the blueberry muffins, you know, things like that. So when someone cooks for you, whether you're at a restaurant or if it be it a friend or family member, um, what catches your attention that someone else does? I, I like that question. I love when people cook for me and I love going out to eat. So that makes a big difference. Um, I think when people, I think you can tell when people care about what they're making and I never, um, I don't like people to be nervous cooking around me. So I really appreciate when somebody will say, Oh, I tried this new recipe and I think it worked, but it's not that great. And we all taste it and eat it. And it's fabulous, you know? So I, I love that just people who will try new things or share their own favorites. Um, I love people who will bake for me, make their favorite cake or cookies and share that. Um, restaurants, I really appreciate uh, how innovative chefs can be with flavors and combinations. And I love going to restaurants in New York and seeing what the trends are in restaurants and, you know, what vegetables they're using and what spices, you know, several years ago, you could really tell everybody was into spice and sriracha sauce and habanero. And so I love seeing how they combined those flavors with maybe something sour or sweet. Um, so really it's about just kind of surprising me and inspiring me. A lot of us learn not just from books, it's also social media. Um, if you want to share with everyone where we can find you on social media. I'd love to. So my Instagram handle, and I'll type this in the chat if people want to copy it, is Tara Teaspoon. I am on uh, Instagram quite a bit. And on Facebook, something I love. And if you guys want to join, I would love it. I have a recipe sharing Facebook group called Live Life Deliciously. It's the same as my cookbook. So Live Life Deliciously Recipe Sharing Group on Facebook. And that's where I'm on there sharing recipes. And you can share your favorites. We can kind of chat about things. It's really fun. And also on my website, tarateaspoon.com. Uh, that's, of course, where all that free content is and amazing recipes and categories. But you can also sign up for my newsletter. And I send exclusive, um, you know, tip sheets and printables and discounts on things and exclusive recipes to my newsletter subscribers. We do have two more questions before we part ways. Um, what is a favorite appetizer or a meal to bring to a potluck? Ooh, great question. I think, I mean, that's two different things, right? So an appetizer to take to a potluck. Um, I'm just flipping again. I, I want to share one of my favorites from the book. Um, I would probably say that bean dip. You know, it's, it's simple, it's refreshing, and it's transportable. So this white bean dip... Um, you can serve it with veggies or with crackers and bread and, you know, yummy things like that. But that for potlucks, for an appetizer, boom, you got it. Um, let me think, what is transportable um, for meals in the book? There are a lot, you know, depending on what your, your potluck is. Um, ooh, 
Okay, so there's a couple. So the lasagna, obviously that is always a fun potluck dish because everyone loves the lasagna. And mine has a little bit of Italian sausage in it and pesto. So it's kind of not your run of the mill um, sort of lasagna. Uh, let me see what else is transportable. I think um, I have some Moroccan kebabs that have this African herb sauce called chamula. And it's easy to make ahead. You can eat it at room temperature. And um, it's a beautiful presentation. So I think that it, it's also like a meal or a snack. Um, that's really fun. And then let me see if I can find one more that is transportable because I think that's such a great idea. Um, and you want things that are taste good warm but also can be eaten room temperature, right? Um, See. There's just so many I'm flipping through. Um, another one maybe would be these dumplings. And they have orange zest in them and this delicious sausage and um, uh, veggie filling. And they're called orange ginger pork dumplings. And it is a great meal and they can be served hot or room temperature with this really great dipping sauce and you can transport that all really easily. So those are some fun potluck entertaining ones. There's a chapter in the book on kitchen tools and must haves. Do you have a good quality kitchen knife recommendation since that's like our number one? Sure. Sure. I, I actually, I have several. So, you know, I am not one of those people who swear by one brand. My biggest things with knives are I want you to go to the store and hold them in your hand and feel them. A really good chef's knife is an investment. You know, you can spend anywhere from $70 to $150 or more on a decent size or I mean a decent chef's knife. And you want it to feel good in your hand. So I always say, even if you're going to buy it online, go to the store, feel the different brands, you know, see how Henkel feels or Wusthof or Global. And those are some of my favorite brands, by the way, that are affordable and really good quality. So it's called Henkel and Wusthof. They're both German based companies. And then Global is, I think, an Asian based uh, company. And I love the feel of all of those. Uh, they hold their edge well. You always have to sharpen your knives, of course. Um, but I would say try those brands and then also explore more expensive ones if you're really into creating a, a nice knife collection. And in addition to the knife, is there any other, what would be your second must-have item? Okay, so here's my thing. I, and I write about this in the cookbook. I, I love a food processor. So, and, and I think... We all have toasters. We all probably have a blender and a hand mixer. And some of us even have a stand mixer. And I think a food processor is often one of those kitchen appliances that people think, oh, it's maybe too expensive or I don't have room for it or I'll save up my money. It's, you know, I'll get it later. But honestly, it is one of those kitchen appliances that I recommend so highly. It makes cooking easier. It makes certain tasks easier. You know, you can make pesto in a second and you can blend things and chop nuts and, um, you know, certain recipes really do need a food processor, like that white bean dip. Sure, you can make it in a blender, but it won't come out the same consistency. So for me, honestly, a food processor, and you can get a very reasonably priced one, but it is a kitchen tool that I can't live without and I highly recommend. Also, is there a right way or what is the right way to sharpen a knife? Oh, good question. So several ways. Um, there's the old school way of getting a, a whetstone and, you know, scraping it along the whetstone, but that's hard and you no have to know what you're doing. Um, I definitely recommend getting either the handheld manual knife sharpeners that you would run your knife through because they have the knife sharpeners already at the correct angle 
within that handheld sharpener and just run your knife through that often to keep the edge. The other thing would be to get an electric knife sharpener. And I really love, I think it's Edgeware brand, has a knife sharpener that you can adjust the angle. Because who knew every knife manufacturer has a different angle on their knife. So generally a chef's knife or you know our kitchen knives have around a 23 degree angle. But some have 21, some have 27. And so in order to not ruin that edge of the blade and keep your knife sharp, one of those electric knife sharpeners that you can get that exact edge is perfect. And they're not that expensive. And you consider how much you invest in your kitchen knives and how often you use them. It's a great investment. The last thing I would suggest for your knives and sharpening them is to just have them professionally done. Every once in a while, I'll send a handful of my knives off to Wooshtoff, you know, and they will sharpen them and mail them back. And then also locally, you can find knife sharpeners at kitchen stores, at different places within your city, and take your knives there and have them professionally sharpen your knives. So I think it's worth it. Um, taking care of your knives and using sharp knives in the kitchen seriously will be the best thing you do for yourself. And it will make you enjoy cooking more. You know, no, it's no fun cooking with a dull knife or not having the right knife. So yeah, good question. On the topic of in, just enjoying cooking, you did talk a lot about utilizing all of the senses in creating your recipes yes. and, and just that connection to memory. Do you, do you just want to comment on that a little bit more for us? Definitely. I mean, I'll, I'll ramble about that. It's, I'm passionate about it. it I really think um, spending time in the kitchen can create those fun memories. And I get it on a Tuesday or a Thursday night when you're just trying to get dinner on the table after a busy day. Sometimes cooking does not seem fun. And I get that. And I really want to create those moments of maybe on the weekend you have a little bit of extra time to try a new recipe. And then that new recipe, because you made it on a Saturday and you had the time and you enjoyed it, you know how to do it. And it became a family favorite. And then you can make it on a Tuesday night no problem. So I really think it's just about pacing and allowing yourself those moments of saying, hey, we're getting takeout tonight, or we're eating this frozen, you know, meal from the fridge. But also trying new things and exploring because, you know, nobody's going to just hand you your next favorite recipe. You really have to try it and cook it, see what you like. I definitely encourage people to make recipes their own. If you don't like a spice, change it with a spice you like or leave it out. If you like heat, add some extra hot sauce or some spice. You know, create those recipes and make them your own and make them work for your family. And I am telling you, that will create these memories and these memorable moments, whether it's cooking together, chopping those vegetables side by side, or eating it and having that conversation around the table. I think it's just so many opportunities to like I said, it's cheesy, but the title of my book, To Live Life Deliciously. Um, it doesn't have to be every day and every meal, but we have that opportunity to have those great moments. So many people today with their, um, with their diet and just their, their work schedule um, create their meals ahead of time. So lots of meal prep. And we do have a question on any tips for meal, meal prep. How do you maintain your quality and taste in the process of meal preparation? You know, it's different every time. It really depends on what your family likes and how you're prepping your meals. Um, but little tips on meal prep that I love is when you get home from the grocery store and you have three different kinds of salad greens and veggies and all of that, and, you know, maybe you're trying to eat healthy or something, I say wash and prep that lettuce. Put it in a Ziploc bag with a paper towel. It will last three times longer than with all the moisture that you have in its you know bag from the grocery store and then you have all of these prepped vegetables and lettuces and ingredients already cleaned and washed that you can just get for your recipes and your meals out of the fridge so that's one of my biggest tips is take that extra 15 20 minutes when you get home to prep those vegetables and the produce and and anything like that that you have and fruits cut up fruit, have it in Tupperware, Ziplocs, that sort of thing. A pre, uh, you know, a prepped 
and planned refrigerator is so much more fun to cook out of than one that you're digging around, old vegetables, throwing things out that you forgot about. The other thing is have a notebook or a piece of paper or literally post-it notes that you stick on the fridge with your week planned out. So nobody likes to be, you know, halfway through a Monday and be like, oh, I don't know what I'm having for dinner. But if you can meal plan even on the weekends or, you know, with your family, get your kids involved, um, get your spouse involved to pick some of their favorite meals and, you know, look at that week and say, all right, I'm going to jot down. I may not stick with it 100%, but I'll know what I'm planning for and making each night. Um, the other tip I would say is when you're meal planning, always incorporate some easy favorites that you almost don't even have to think about. If you love spaghetti, throw that in on a Wednesday because you won't need a recipe. You don't need special ingredients. And it just kind of gives your brain and your week a break. And then save that special recipe for like Friday night that you're trying out of my new cookbook, you know, and that's when you have a little bit more time. You try a new recipe you don't want to be exploring and innovating every day of the week or you'll get burned out. So that's my other meal planning tip, but I hope that helps a little bit. Before we do part ways, did you have any just kind of like just to go wisdom for us for before we head off into the kitchen? <laughs> you bet. I'm going to change your life right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I can impart any great wisdom, um, but I just – I'm happy to spend time with fellow food lovers and cookbook appreciators. I, I say, share your love and your goodness through food. Um, we really have come through a really hard year where we haven't had an opportunity in most places where we live to bring people together in our kitchens and around our table. And there are certainly other ways we can share food, you know, dropping it off to people. Um, I'm a huge proponent of making you know, little freezer type meals and taking it to the single women in your neighborhood or, you know, that couple down the street that can't cook for themselves or something. Just kind of reach out of yourself with food. I, I love that this last year has allowed us to do that a little bit more. And as we become more safe and able to gather, um, I hope that everyone will find new foods that they love, bring people together. It just, um, like I've talked about, creates those memories. Food is really a memory instigator. Um, and so whether you are alone, make something new for yourself, make something comforting, try that mac and cheese in the cookbook, um, or whether you're with your family or bringing people together. Um, I just wish everyone well in the kitchen and, and hope that it brings you joy. And everyone's welcome to um, follow Tara on Instagram, Facebook, um, in her recipe sharing group there on Facebook as well. And we do have the book here. If anyone wanted to place a hold on it in the catalog, it's under Tara Bench um, and it's available to place a hold. And for curbside pickup right now is for being safe. Perfect. So feel free to do that as well. We do just want to thank you for being here and thanks everyone for joining wherever you're tuning in from. Um, thanks to Shadow Mountain Publishing for allowing us this opportunity to have you with us this evening. Um, and just, just thank you for sharing everything from your beautiful new cookbook. Mm -hmm.